Greetings and God's blessing. This is Father John Corapi with another episode of Weekly Wisdom. Today we're going to speak about the year of St. Paul. You know, the Holy Father last year in uh, 2007 announced that there would be a very special uh, year in the church uh, to uh, commemorate the uh, 2000th anniversary of the birth of St. Paul, the great apostle to the Gentiles. Let me read to you from the, uh, the original letter that uh, the Holy Father um, prepared at Vatican City. Um, I got this from Zenit. If, if you don't know about Zenit, it's a good thing. Z-E-N-I-T. It's a new Catholic news service. Uh, you can subscribe to it uh, on the Internet. It's free. Uh, at least last time I checked, it was free. And uh, a lot of news about what's going on in the church. It's, it's a, a very good service. Uh, they said uh, that Benedict XVI has declared June 2008 through June 2009 the year of St. Paul in celebration of the 2000th anniversary of the saint's birth. The Pope decreed the year in a Vesper celebration uh, held on June 28th, the year 2007 at St. Paul outside the walls, great basilica in Rome. The Holy Father explained during his homily, this Pauline year will take place in a special way in Rome, where for 2,000 years, under the papal altar of this basilica, lies the tomb that, according to experts and undisputed tradition, has conserved the remains of the apostle St. Paul. Uh, just as a side note, um, after I was ordained, uh, at St. Peter's Basilica in 1991. I, I uh, celebrated my first Mass uh, in the uh, crypt of St. Peter's over the tomb of, of St. Peter in the Clementine Chapel. And then my second Mass was at um, uh, St. Mary Major. And then the third one was at St. John Lateran. And my fourth Mass was at St. Paul outside the walls. Those are the four great major basilicas uh, in Rome. Uh, the pontiff said in the papal basilica and Benedictine Abbey attached to it, there can take place a series of liturgical, cultural, and ecumenical events, as well as various pastoral and social initiatives, all of them inspired by Pauline spirituality. Special attention can also be given to pilgrims who from various places will want to go to the tomb of the apostle in a penitential way in order to find spiritual benefits. Uh, that would be a great pilgrimage to make, and I assure you it will be penitential considering the state of the airlines today. <laughs> so you could make a trip to Rome and uh, visit the tomb of St. Paul. You'll get many great blessings, and it'll be more than worth the aggravation you'll probably have to put up by uh, traveling by air. Um, no, it's probably not that bad. Maybe they'll figure something out uh, by that, the time you go. Meetings for study will be promoted and there will be special publications on Pauline text to promote the immense rit richness of the teaching contained in them, uh, true patrimony of humanity redeemed by Christ. Uh, also, in every part of the world, similar initiatives will be organized in dioceses, sanctuaries, and places of prayer by religious institutions, uh, institutes of study and assistance which carry the name of St. Paul or which have been inspired by him and his teaching. Uh, Benedict XVI explained that this year must have an, an important ecumenical dimension. Why do you suppose that is? Why do you suppose the Pope wants this year of St. Paul to have a, a particularly ecumenical dimension to it? Well, remember who St. Paul was, the apostle to the Gentiles. Okay? He went to those outside of the, uh, the Jewish faith, the chosen people. Uh, and he was concerned, that, and, and he knew that God's uh, salvation was offered to all people. And so uh, the um, uh, emphasis on ecumenism in this year of St. Paul is very important. Um, we, we should uh, hope for unity among all the Christian churches. So what we're going to do, uh, do our little part, uh, I'm going to... Uh, dedicate uh, a lot of our uh, teaching and preaching time to St. Paul. Uh, technically, this will begin June 29th this year, 2008, with the um, 
the great feast of uh, the Apostle St. Peter and Paul. And um, what we'll do is we'll be preparing a very special series, uh, a rather extensive series, throughout the course of the, uh, the year. Uh, I don't know exactly uh, how many um, presentations that will be in this, but quite a few. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the entire Pauline corpus from the New Testament. That's all the letters of St. Paul. And I'm going to even in include the letter to the Hebrews, which um, most, probably most contemporary scholars uh, would say St. Paul was probably not the author of the letter to the Hebrews. Um, whenever we come to that, we, we say uh, a, a reading from the letter, uh, the, the letter to the Hebrews. Um, we don't say it's St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews, but many of the saints, fathers and doctors of the church um, throughout the ages, um, believe St. Paul uh, was the author. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not convinced either way. But I'm just going to, as an arbitrary subjective thing, I'm including it. And that'll be 99 chapters in total, 99 chapters of um, the writings of St. Paul. And what I'm going to do in that is I'm going to preach. Uh, that's what I do. Um, it, it wouldn't be well for me to, to try to do something other than what I'm called to do, and I'm, called, I'm basically a preacher. Uh, certainly there's teaching involved uh, in preaching. But by and large, I'm a preacher, so I'm going to preach on the letters of St. Paul from beginning to end. What I'll do is I'll synthesize uh, one letter at a time. Uh, we'll, we'll begin um, uh, right with the, the letter to the Romans, and we'll go through, and I will synthesize into X number of, of sermons uh, the letters of St. Paul. And um, we, we, it's such a rich thing. I could preach on the letters of St. Paul for the rest of my life and never exhaust that great richness. Um, I've preached probably uh, as much on the letters of St. Paul as, as on um, any of the, the uh, books of sacred scripture, with the exception of the Gospels, perhaps. Uh, and so what do we learn from St. Paul so much? You know, um, a great deal of our theology in the Catholic Church comes from uh, the, the various letters of St. Paul, especially in moral theology. Uh, he, he was a great moral theologian. He was, of course, an apostle, the apostle to the Gentile. His, he was a bishop, of course. Um, and uh, what he did was he performed the primary function of uh, a, a bishop. Uh, he confirmed the brethren. He preached. He taught. That's what he did. Uh, he wasn't a local priest. He wasn't a, what we would call a parish priest. Uh, he traveled. He went to the various churches, and he preached. He was a preacher. Um, the uh, mission preachers uh, that have uh, operated in the church ever since St. Paul uh, are in that tradition. Myself, that's what I've done, mostly. Now, uh, we, I, I assure you, if St. Paul were alive and, and working in the church today, he'd have a website. There's no question about that. St. Paul would have a website. St. Paul, would, on, would, would he'd be on EWTN, for sure. St. Paul would be on the radio. St. Paul will be using every means available to spread the gospel. There's no question about it, and that's why we do it. Uh, it's so important. Um, you know, I started out doing the only thing I could do in the beginning, which was basically the, the same thing St. Paul did, physically traveling every place. Going to little parishes in the beginning, I remember uh, uh, right when I finished my studies, I, I started to preach immediately, immediately. Uh, and I'd get on airplanes or, or, you know, automobiles, whatever it took to get to little parishes here and there, sometimes preaching to as few as a dozen people, 20 people. Um, and then over time, the, uh, the congregations, the audiences, became bigger and bigger, and uh, then we eventually did what we always knew we would do, what my superiors in the church um, said that I would do. We used the means of social communication, uh, as the church has mandated, uh, to preach the gospel. And so we began with television and radio, and then eventually uh, with the internet. And so 
St. Paul, the great apostle to the Gentiles, uh, he taught so many things. You know, some of the key things that he taught, moral theology, we said that, you know, in the, uh, in, in the um, first of St. Paul's letters, listed chronologically, I mean, the first in the Bible, uh, Romans has 16 chapters. And um, it, it, it's, uh, it's pretty strong, um, as many of his letters are. Um, they're, 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 they, you know, the, he talked to the Romans and um, spoke about several things. Now, St. Paul was a straight shooter, as were all of the saints. Um, that something, I think, over the years has happened. Uh, I don't know if we, perhaps we think that um, somehow by toning things down we have a better chance of succeeding. Uh, there's a certain truth in that, uh, but only to a point. You don't want to tone it down uh, to, to where it becomes unrecognizable. Um, <laughs> St. Saint, Saint Paul didn't do that. Uh, in, in Romans, right off in chapter 1, he talked about the, not being ashamed of the gospel. Um, <laughs> Are we ashamed of the gospel? I sometimes wonder today because we are pretty quiet in the face of gross moral evil uh, quite frequently, quite frequently. Now, you know, everyone in the church pretty much knows, well, I shouldn't say that. We used to know what the church held in various moral areas. The church still holds the same exact thing that she ever held in basic moral teaching. But a lot of people have become confused because of or uh, maybe ambiguous teaching. The teaching itself isn't ambiguous. It's straightforward, black and white truth. Um, but St. Paul talked to the Romans. Uh, he said, you know, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Now, why would he say that? Well, because a lot of people were, were uh, ashamed of the gospel. They were afraid in a pagan atmosphere to give witness to the truth of the gospel. Um, my grandmother used to say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. All right? Uh, look at today. How many Catholics are ashamed of the gospel? You know, they, they're afraid. Uh, you don't have to preach sermons on street corners. You don't have to be loud about it. You don't have to be obnoxious about it. Quiet strength. Knowing that you're right. You know, in a neo-pagan society... Don't be ashamed of the gospel. We're right. They're wrong. Very simple. Uh, he talked to the <laughs> Roman. You said your, your senseless minds are darkened. You know, you don't know your left hand or your right. You're given up to lust. Um, he, he could be he, talking to this generation in particular. Um, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, he said to them. How often that's happened here. He spoke about homosexuality. Um, there are those today who would distort and pervert the word of God, trying to say that, that it's just fine. It's, it's okay, you know, if that's what you want to do, fine. It's just an alternative lifestyle. Once again, using verbal engineering to confuse people. The, 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 the word of God doesn't say it's fine. Uh, St. Paul's very, very clear that it is an evil thing. We're not saying people that have a certain orientation are evil, but acting out on that orientation is serious sin, mortal sin. St. Paul's clear on that. Um, he says that since they didn't see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a base mind and improper conduct. And they were filled with all kind of wickedness. This is how St. Paul talked. Can you imagine... Today, if St. Paul, or in fact Jesus, went to many of our churches today, um, I know this because I've preached in far more churches than the average priest. Uh, I've traveled two million miles preaching the gospel. I've preached in 49 states, multiple dioceses in, in, in some of those states, uh, several foreign countries. Um, and, and I've had a in, by and large, a much better than average response, but I've also gone to the places who invited me and they knew what they were getting. If I were to go to your average parish, many places, uh, the, the re response would not be as good. A lot of places, they'd run you out of town on a rail. 
I used to, in the beginning, before my reputation preceded me, I used to tell uh, whoever was traveling with me, I said, keep, keep the vehicle running. We might have to make a quick getaway. Because, you know, sometimes when you talk like St. Paul, uh, they, don't, they don't like it very much. Um, St. Paul said to the Romans, you're filled with wickedness. You're evil. Filled with covetousness, malice. You're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity. You're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, and boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to your parents. You're foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. <laughs> Those were just some of the, a few of the things St. Paul said. That's how he talked, straight forward. And I'll tell you something, nobody was ever confused about what he meant. He was a straight shooter. You know, uh, Jesus said, say yes when you mean no, yes and no when you mean no. Yes when you mean yes and no when you mean no, all else is from the evil one. In other words, what he was saying was just speak the truth clearly and unambiguously. <laughs> How often I remember when I began uh, preaching, I would uh, I I was a preacher from the first day of my of my ministry, and I remember on a few occasions when I was beginning, I there would be a priest or a monsignor or even a bishop. Who, who would uh, try to restrain me and hold me back, rein me back, say, now don't talk about it. I remember one Monsignor when I went to do a parish mission in Lent. He said, now, Father, please don't talk about sin. Don't talk about sin. During Lent, your people were immaculately conceived. You know, that, that, hey, a Lenten mission. I'm going to talk about sin. I'm going to talk about grace. You have to. How do you get around that? I remember a bishop one time said to me, now, now, John, I want you to be smooth. This is an exact quote. <laughs> not exaggerating. And he wasn't a bad bishop. He was a good bishop. But he said to me, he, he meant well, but he, he said, now, John, I want you to be smooth. I want you to be nuanced in your presentation. I've come over the years to hate that word, nuance. If I ever run into a nuance, I'll strangle it. I, I want you to be nuanced in your presentation. I want you to be smooth, right? You know, say yes when you mean yes, and say no when you mean no, or else you run the risk of becoming confused and confusing others. Uh, you know, the truth is pure intelligibility. God, by definition, is pure intelligibility, but we like to complicate a perfectly intelligible and simple thing. And then, it, you know, we, we like to nuance pure intelligibility. That's God and the things as they pertain to God. That's theology. The Defin definition of theology is the science of the study of God and all things else as they pertain to God. We like to take the pure intelligibility, which is truth, uh, God himself, take pure intelligibility and nuance it into utter ambiguity. And that is why people very frequently, even in the church, are confused about that things. Um, I've had people ask me, I had a woman uh, uh, ask me the other day after Mass, um, I, I, very rare that I do it, but I, I was celebrating Mass at a parish, and after she, she came up to me, her dad had passed away, and, and she said, is there still purgatory? I've, I've been <laughs> asked that exact question um, many, many times because uh, the people have, haven't been taught clearly or they haven't been taught at all in many cases. And so it's like, I mean, did God abolish purgatory? Is there still purgatory? Uh, yeah, yeah. She was worried about that. She was afraid like it's a horrible thing. No, no, I told her it's the mercy of God. It's the mercy of God. But sometimes they'll take pure intelligibility and they'll nuance it into utter ambiguity. St. Paul did not do that. St. Paul was very clear in his teaching. You know, if you have ever listened to certain preachers or teachers of the faith, and uh, you know they sound very erudite sometimes, they're very smooth, uh, very nuanced in their presentation, and I, I rem <laughs> it reminds me of um, 
sophistry. You know what a sophist is in uh, the history of Greek philosophy? Uh, the sophists were smooth talkers. The sophists um, would uh, hold forth, they, they talked for money. Uh, they'd, they'd talk uh, in very, very um, articulate, eloquent terms. And, uh, you know, after they get, got done, the, the people listening, uh, you know, the, uh, usually the educated, upper-class people, the sophisticated people would say, oh, uh, didn't um, whatever his name was, Damocles, Sophocles, whoever it might be, oh, didn't he speak wonderfully, how beautiful. Yeah, and then some old farmer with common sense said, yeah, but what did he say? He didn't say anything. Sound familiar? Watch out. A lot of sophists. Oh, they're smooth, they're articulate, they're eloquent, but they don't say anything. Be careful. What is the substance? St. Paul had substance. St. Paul wasn't one of these. He didn't look impressive, you know. He wasn't a, a magnificent, no doubt, tall, handsome man that commanded the audience. No, we have evidence from, from the writings that, no, he was small of stature. He wasn't so impressive. And he didn't engage in sophistry. Yeah, he, he, he didn't try to um, uh, tell smooth uh, tales. He didn't, one thing he didn't do, he did not confirm people in their sins. You know, you can become very popular as a speaker, even in the church, by telling people what they want to hear. Uh, that's, that's terrible. You know, don't, you know, don't tell people what they want to hear. Tell them what they need to hear. In other words, tell them the truth. That's what St. Paul did. He told the truth. He preached the truth in love. Um, don't think for a moment it is pastoral, merciful, or charitable to confirm people in their sins. Oh, you're okay. I'm okay. Whatever you want to do is all right. God loves you just where you're at. <laughs> God does love you wherever you are, but he doesn't love your sins. Your sins are like cancer eating you alive. I'm not going to tell you it's all right. When it's not, St. Paul didn't say it was okay. He was clear, and he was forceful. And where did the power of his preaching uh, come from? Well, he wasn't ashamed of the gospel. We know that. Um, something else, though. The power of the cross. Our theology of the cross, uh, to a large extent, comes from St. Paul. His interpretation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of the events of the Paschal Mystery. Um, my doctoral thesis in dogmatic theology was on the subject of the meaning of Christian suffering. You know, uh, uh, the cross stands at the veritable uh, uh, apex of our faith. Um, it can be summed up, basically, no pain, no gain, no cross, no crown, no goal, no glory. Good Friday always precedes Easter Sunday. We get a lot of this. This is from St. Paul. Uh, a lot of our um, what's called soteriology, um, that, that is the branch of, of theology that deals with uh, the Paschal mystery, the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. Uh, our, our Christology, much of it, comes from St. Paul. Um, remember, he, he said, is no longer... I who live, but Christ who lives within me. It is when I am weak that I am strong, St. Paul says. Uh, God's mighty power is brought to perfection in weakness. Uh, he, he understood this. This is where all the power for the church's work comes from. It's a paradox. Uh, the cross itself is a paradox to the... Um, unenlightened mind, the person without faith, the cross is a scandal, you know, it's a stumbling block, and it's absurdity to people who don't have faith. But for those have, who have faith, that's the power of God working for salvation. This, this is St. Paul's teaching. This is the crux of much of St. Paul's uh, teaching. You know, uh, this has practical significance. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, during the course of the, uh, the coming year uh, in this um, series on, on St. Paul, um, e every one of us in some way suffers this. 
you suffer from physical things. Um, you're getting older. I don't know anybody who isn't getting older. Uh, every one of us is getting older. Uh, if it hasn't caught up with you yet, eventually you'll begin to lose your strength, your agility. You'll have more aches and pains. Your eyesight won't be as sharp as it used to be. Your hearing won't be as good as it one day was. Uh, all these things, this is a kind of, uh, we're being consumed. Every moment, uh, we're being consumed. Now, the theology of St. Paul shows us that that's not a negative thing. That's a plus sign. The cross is not negative. The cross is a plus sign. Just look at it. Looks like a plus sign to me, physically. It's a plus sign. Now, that, that's easy to say, hard to interiorize, you know. You may be going through um, terrible physical sufferings. You might have uh, arthritis uh, of the worst kind. They're not so bad, but it's painful. You know, you could have a heart condition. You might have cancer, God forbid, or any number of a thousand other afflictions that, that beset uh, humanity. It's the teaching of St. Paul, primarily. The Word of God, as, as spoken and preached by St. Paul, recorded in those letters, um, that really gives us hope. You know, dying, Jesus destroyed our death. Rising, he restored our life. And so we live through him, with him, and in him. And so as you're getting older, you have more physical things wrong with you. You may have emotional suffering, depression, anxiety. So many people suffer today. You know, they tell me that the main classification of pharmaceuticals today are, 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 are you know, antidepressants and things in those categories. Um, a lot of the people that are they're prescribed for, I'm not sure if that's the best answer for them or not. Some people undoubtedly probably need something. But uh, it, it is a commentary on the state of society, that, that that's the way we are. We have to be medicated so much. Well, if you, if you need to take medicine, take it. I'm not telling you not to. You should. But after you've done everything you can and you're still struggling, you're still suffering, like my grandma said, offer it up. Uh, you know, a great deal of St. Paul's teaching and theology can be summed up in that old axiom, which we don't hear much any, anymore. Uh, you hear it from me and maybe a couple other people in the church, but... It used to be a common saying in Catholic households whenever you dealt with affliction or, or pain or suffering. Offer it up. And what that means is unite yourself with Jesus. You are united to him through your baptism and through receiving the Holy Eucharist. And so unite your suffering, your difficulties, your struggles, even things that are, that are, that are sinful. Well, how can you unite a sin with Jesus? Well, you, you, you don't, but the struggle... You, can, you may have a lifelong struggle with an affliction. Uh, it, it may be a disease. It may be like alcoholism, drug addiction. Uh, certainly that's not of God, but God sympathizes with your struggles. And your struggles are not in vain. Unite them to Jesus. How do you do that? An act of the will. An act of the will. The sisters, when I was growing up, the nuns used to teach the kids for First Communion, now children, um, at Mass. Uh, when, the pri when the priest elevates the paten with the consecrated host and, and the chalice with the precious blood, and he says, through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor to you, Almighty Father, forever and ever. You put yourself with all your struggles, all your difficulties, all your defects, you, you put yourself through an act of the will on the paten and in the chalice. And let the priest offer you up, offer you up to God our Father, through, with, and in Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. That, that's some of the substance, the essence, uh, synthesis of St. Paul's magnificent teaching. It's right at the heart of our faith. And so in the coming year, we'll talk a lot about St. Paul. We'll preach on, uh, on his letters. There are 99 chapters, if you if you include uh, Hebrews, and we will um, we'll preach on those, all the substance of the letters of St. Paul. I think you'll get a lot out of it, so you look forward to that. Uh, that'll be coming. Well, God bless you, God love you, and goodbye.